First of all, about the weather, I don't know who was here yesterday, but I was under my bed at about 5 o'clock yesterday afternoon. I mean, those are some big storms. That was spectacular stuff. I love that stuff. I spent a lot of time, I actually researched the speech. I used to do a lot of speeches when my, when my books came out. And Joe Capazzolo called me about eight times this past year, and he goes, you got to do this, you got to do this. I said, Joe, I don't do that anymore. I'm busy. I got 110 sales reps. I'm always traveling. I, I, I'm flattered, but I can't. He goes, man, you got to do this, and I'm glad that I'm here. This is unbelievably exciting to me. I have adult, I have ADH. My kids have ADH, and we share the Adderall. My daughter's the only one who's really on the prescription, but we all share it. So with that, I'm going to need some help. You were very brave to be here in the front because I felt like an usher in the back in church, right? Everybody wanted to go up there. So I'm going to forget stuff, and you got to help. If I, no, 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 I'm not going to give you anything. Just eyeball me. Dreams. If I don't talk about dreams, just yell it out later, right? Disney and the cow. Yeah, yeah. If I don't get to that, then I've missed, I've missed the whole thing. But what you do, ladies and gentlemen, here's what I'm going to try to do in a half hour and 40 minutes. I'm going to try to inspire you, make you aim higher than you ever have before, and I'm going to try to touch your hearts. Because what you do is the most important thing in American business. American business, you know, we, we, got, we got iPhones and B phones, and we got all this great technology, right? And everybody's on those laptops and the millenniums, da 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 And we've had the worst 10 years in our, in our economy since the Depression. And everybody wants to pull back. The most important thing in a business is atmosphere and making people feel like they work at a great company. And it's about great meetings, and it's about dancing, and it's about inspiring people. Remember the Jerry Maguire? You're not old enough. Remember the Jerry Maguire movie? Hey, we were talking, don't make me come back to that. We were talking about old things before. Has anybody, who's been in a phone booth? Right, remember phone booths? <laughs> hey, I just turned 61, not bad, right? Not bad. What was I talking about? Jerry Maguire, right? So Jerry Maguire gets fired by the agency, okay? And he, you know, he's going to start this new thing, and Zanelle Wiggler, whatever her name is, is the actress in the thing, and she walks, Zellweger, right? She walks out with the goldfish, right? She's going to go start this new company with him. And she goes home, and her sister said, what are you doing? What's he going to pay you? Are you doing the right thing? What about your kid? And she goes, you know what? It's not just about the money. I want to be inspired, right? We watched Derek G today, and I get chills because I'm a big Yankee fan. And we go to the theater, and we see a great show and we get thrills. Why can't business be like that? And I'm going to tell you, if you've ever, Joe's been in the environment, come to my office. or I owe those kids that. I, they're the, the two most favorite meetings I go to, I go to 10 cities, are the kickoff meeting. I love planning that, right? I want, because that's the most important meeting of the year. We set the theme, right? And I want that meeting to live. It can't go away when in June they say, what the hell were they talking about? Oh, yeah. Right? I want, and then the President's Club trip. I love those two. The rest of the meetings are harrowing, right? We're trying to grow revenue. People are quitting. Those are the meetings you get heart attacks over. But I love the kickoff meeting and the President's Club meeting. And these kids, these men and women die to go on that trip, don't they? And when they get on that trip, I want them to go, wow. I want their sp spouses to say, wow. So what you do is really, really important. And you've got to get to people on my level and let them know that. So I got online. I actually did research. And anybody go to the University of Dayton? I graduated from the University of Dayton. When my father, you know, a lot of you, you have kids that graduated. Summa cum laude. My father said, Lordy, how come? I'll get into that later. Anyway, I get online. I, and I'm, I'm, I got Harvard Business Review and all this. And these are the things, because I'm going to ask you to think differently. You're going to walk out of this room, fire. we're going to go running out of this tunnel, right? And you've got to get to the sea level, because that's the man or woman who's got the money, right? That's who's going to spend the money and has to understand why the meeting or the event's important, because not everybody thinks. A lady said to me, she works, where's the lady who works at the church? Right? It's tough. You know, when I, keep, bring me back to this, okay? 
Because when I do these speeches, right, the night before you go, to, you go to dinner with the CEO and the senior staff, and they go, this is how, when you hear a company say, this is how we've always done this, get the body bags ready because they're in trouble. They are in big trouble because I wake up and go to bed paranoid every day because I know the competition, and I'm going to stay ahead of them. We went in Columbus State and Cincinnati. We opened three offices for an older company from zero to almost 60 million when this year closed, selling copy machines. You think that's exciting? You sell dancing and fun and Abe Lincoln, I'm selling copy machines and convincing people it's exciting. But I've gotta have the trips to do it, they've gotta feel great. I want them to come to work. So I, this one thing says, a study on business travel by a global research for, firm, Oxford Economics, I figure that's smart people, provides clear evidence that business travel leads to an increase in both corporate and revenue and profits. In fact, the study found that every dollar invested in business meeting travel results in $12 in added revenue and $3.8 in new profits. It's a big deal. It's why people come to work and they want to feel great about it. So what you do is really, really important. And that's how you have to wake up in the morning thinking, that presentation lit my hair on fire. And that's the difference. We sell 20 different types of copiers, and if my sales rep can't make your hair sizzle when you come in for a demo, they're gonna get beat by the competition. And if they're talking to the wrong person, there's a good chance they won't get the deal, right? So we're gonna think, and we're gonna act, and we're gonna do things different. You guys with me? Yes, yes. okay. So change, it's very, very important to change. Everybody clap. Very good. Clap with your other hand on top. Oh, very muffled. You're not athletic, are you? You missed your hand. Change is very difficult. You've been clapping like that. I've been doing this since 61 years. I comb my hair the same way. I do everything the same. Change is very, very, di hey, that's the way they do it. You know, I'm not, can't do that, right? You know, we want people who believe in the impossible, right? Fold your arms. Now fold your arms the opposite way. Not easy, you missed a little slit there, didn't you? <laughs> change is very, very difficult. And change doesn't have to be the greatest, the newest thing, right? There have been some unbelievable innovations in old businesses. People who were willing to take risk. Who's got risk here? Who's, you yell that out when I get done with the story, okay? Right? Remember the mail. We've been delivering the mail for how long? since the stagecoach, right? right? We've been delivering the mail. So we've had mail in America for a long time. Who remembers the US Post Office? Remember we used to complain about the mail? Remember that? Remember those days? Well, this guy down in Memphis, about 28 years ago, says this mail thing's boring as hell. Nobody likes the post office. The mail goes to the wrong place. It's a nickel a stamp. There's no margins. It's not what the customer wants. I'm going to buy these big jumbo planes, and I'm going to guarantee you your mail gets there the next day. Now, I'm going to charge you an arm and a leg because you were late for the birthday or it just absolutely had to be there or, or, or the world was going to come to an end. So I'm going to charge you out the wazoo, but you're not going to care because it's really great. It goes in this envelope, and when you open up the envelope, what's in it? The mail, right? Fred Smith at FedEx took this old industry and he took a risk and he had the guts because he listened to what the customer needed. He said, there's a different way to do it, right? Then there was this crazy mop hair. He had red hair somewhere from the Northwest. About 28 years ago, he goes, you know, these big computing towers people need, we don't need that anymore. In 20 years, everybody's gonna have these little black boxes on their tables and they're going to communicate with each other. I don't know if he ever made it. His name was Gates, Microsoft or something like that. People that have that kind of vision. One of the best, who, anybody fly here Southwest? Okay. Southwest Airlines, the airline industry the last 10 years, ladies and gentlemen, a complete disaster, right? It's completely changed from, I don't do speeches anymore because I just can't deal with it. I, I can't be late, I, I can't be, I, I just can't do it, right? It's just so difficult. You go through the lines. I'm, I mean, I was almost naked coming through, through the Columbus airport yesterday. More, and they go, yeah, yeah. I said, that's it. That's as far as I'm going, or I'm staying home, right? 
Southwest Airlines, so I had an opportunity to visit them because their customer sat is the best. And I'm writing my second book, and I do this visit, and then I go, but I really like to see what's really happening because the employees will tell you what's happening. CEO is going to tell you all the great things about their company, right? Where's the mayor? Mayor's already gone. He was, you know, Mesa's the greatest place in the world. But the people who work there will let you know. So Columbus, Ohio Airport, Delta, Southwest right next to it. The Delta booth in their boring Delta blue outfits with their boring, th and they hate the fact that you're there online. They just want you to go away. They don't even look up at you. They just want the day to be over with. What a great place to work, right? So I get my ticket, and I'm walking by, and I see the Southwest booth. This is 12, 15 years ago. And there they are in their khakis, right? And it's all decorated and all that. Some, some, one of the guys is putting the golf bags on the tram in the back. And I yell out, hey, do you guys like to work here? Ladies and gentlemen, in unison, they said, yes. And I said, why? And they said, because of Herb. Herb Kelleher, the CEO. They didn't say because of Six Sigma or, or you know, we do this or we do that. Because Herb had built a culture, right, that separated them from every other airline. So I've kept this for, for years and years because everybody else complains about the industry. It's really great, as soon as I find where I put it. So in 1993, at the height of, their, of, the, of the Southwest bubble, right, seven, there were, in the, in the USA Today, and I read the USA Today because it's in color and there's little snippets, because you know, I don't like to read, I can't read that much. I can only stay with it for a little bit. Eight airlines in 1993 lost anywhere from $400 million to $3 billion. Did you know American Airlines lost $3 billion in 1993? Do you know anything about flying or running an airline? Ma'am, if you and I were running that airline, we wouldn't have lost $3 billion. We would have shut the damn thing down, right? We just wouldn't have let it happen, okay? One company made almost a billion dollars in profit. Who do you think it was? It was Southwest. The last time I checked, they put the same gas in the plane because United's saying, hey, the gas rates, you know, what do you want us to do? And the cargo rates at the, you know, U.S. Air saying we can't afford that. But Kelleher found a different way to do it. And that's what we're trying to do in our industry. How do we go sell copiers differently with more energy with people who get in front of that customer who make their hair go on fire? That's what this thing's all about. You guys with me? So risk-taking. So that all comes down to taking a risk. Who in here takes big risks? Okay. Who's sometimes afraid to take a risk? Right? Because sometimes if you do it, you think they may fire you. Or, you know, I'm not sure if it's going to work. But so, Joe, we were talking about this speech. And um, I, was, I was giving a speech to Nextel about five years ago. And the CEO goes, who do you think was the biggest risk-taker of all time? So I'm getting ready for the speech, and I'm thinking, could it be Columbus who sailed over wherever he sailed to get here, or John Glenn going up to the... Who was the biggest risk taker ever? And it occurred to me, who was the guy who milked the first cow? And then he drank the milk, right? So it's all about risk taking. So in the theme of energy, so how, how do we keep people fighting? Because what you do, right? We're looking forward to the meeting. We're looking forward to moving our company along. So the greatest locker room speech of all time, and I'm an enormous sports figure, and I love listening to all that because I get inspired. And You inspired me, and I love that. I'm going to talk to our people about that, right? So I'm going to show you what I believe. This is President Roosevelt. We've just been bombed, right? Pearl Harbor's been bombed. You're going to hear the greatest locker room speech of all time. Is it true men are still trapped alive inside the Arizona? We can hear tapping from inside the hole. We're doing everything we can to get to them, but they're 40 feet below water. We've been trained to think that we're invincible. And now our proudest ships has been destroyed by an enemy we considered inferior. We're on the ropes, gentlemen. That's exactly why 
We have to strike back now. We're preparing an attack against the Marshall and Gilbert Islands, sir, to keep I'm our... I'm talking about hitting the heart of Japan, the way they have hit us. Mr. President, Pearl Harbor caught us unawares because we didn't face facts. This isn't a time for ignoring them again. The Army Air Corps has long-range bombers, but no place to launch them. Midway is too far, and Russia won't allow us to launch a raid from there. Admiral? Navy's planes are small. They carry light loads and have a short range. We'd have to get them within a few hundred miles of Japan and therefore risk our carriers. And if we lose our carriers, we'll have no shield against invasion. Does anyone in this room think that victory is possible without facing danger? We are at war. Of course there's a risk. But consider the risk, Mr. President. If the Japanese invade us right now, they would penetrate as far as Chicago before we could stop them. Gentlemen, most of you did not know me when I had the use of my legs. I was strong and proud and arrogant. Now I wonder every hour of my life why God put me into this chair. But when I see defeat in the eyes of my countrymen, in your eyes right now, I start to think that maybe he brought me down for times like these when we all need to be reminded who we truly are, that we will not give up or give in. Mr. President, with all respect, sir, what you're asking can't be done. Get back, George. Get back. Do not tell me it can't be done. That's unbelievable, isn't it? So we're, we're always looking for a way to inspire and take people to another level. The most misunderstood and misused, and I know, remember flip charts, ladies and gentlemen? They didn't even know what it was back here. I had to beg for one. Okay. Can you see this at all? I'll tell you what it says. I'll bring it to the front. Since it's light and I've been working out. Okay. Great technology. You cannot have a great business without great people. Nothing supplants talent. So we try to create an environment where we recruit the very best, and then we create an atmosphere with training and, and, and the great atmosphere that we create and the opportunity to grow for them and their families. Because we'll get in front of a customer. Ohio State University is my largest customer. We service and sell 11,000 machines there. They bill almost $800,000 a month. It is enormous. And I will tell them more important than you are my people. Because if Bill Matthews and the 20 people who handle Ohio State believe in Comdoc, know our product, know exactly where the competition's coming from, and listen to the customer at Ohio State, that's my best opportunity to impact the customer. You with me, right? If I have sales reps that get in front of a customer, oh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I know we screw, you know, we always screw that up, right? We need people that when they come in front of you, you feel great about them and you feel great about the product and the service that we're gonna offer. That's what gets you the customer, okay? So people, the most misused technology in America, I, I had my group the other day, and I said, what we do is very, very difficult. If it doesn't feel right, do something else. You have to have the gub. We all hear the cliche, you got to do what feels great. If you don't like it, don't do it. You got to get out of there, right? Because you can see the people just shuffling around. They're just going through the motions. Bad app, can't have it, right? So we've got to bring in the great people, but the pressure on me and, and my staff is to keep that atmosphere going. Can you imagine? Every day, what are we doing? We're always talking about how do we, keep, how do we make it better for them? 
because that'll trickle to the customer, and that'll separate us from the competition. Cheating. i can tell you a great story about cheating, and I don't mean signing a contract or anything like that. Back in 1971, I go to the University of Dayton. It was the only school I got into. I went to Brooklyn Prep High School in, in, um, in, in, in New York City, and I applied to Brown and Boston College and Notre Dame. My father and I were big Notre Dame fans. We'd listen to all the games on the radio and watch them when it was on TV. The minute we got rejected, my father wanted them to lose anything they ever did after that, right? So one of the priests go, hey, we found this school out in the Midwest. It's called Dayton. It's good for your level of academics. We'll get you right in. Go out there. So um, I was very, very fortunate. My father drives me to the airport. You know, instead of you guys packing up the car, I, I fly out to the University of Dayton. And at the airport, he goes, Frank, I want you to do two things. I want you to have the best four years of your life and don't let mom and dad down. I did one of the two. I had the five best years of college in college history until my two kids went there and broke all my records. But I let mom and dad down. Very Italian family. I got a 1.4 cume my freshman year. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you that it's harder to do than getting a 4.0. At the University of Dayton at that time, if you showed up for class, they would give you a C because they needed the money, right? They needed you to stay, right? So it's a complete disaster. It's now summertime. I got to go to summer school. Dad won't talk to me. A couple of weeks go by, and I go see my mom. My mom a, was a short Italian lady. She looked, like a, she looked like a refrigerator with a head on it. <laughs> Loved her. She had that mop peanut and she's stirring the sauce. And I go, Mom, blood's thicker than water. He can't be that mad. She went, ah. So finally, and, ladies, and this is an absolute true story. And I, I still use it when I talk to our sales force and all that. And I said to my dad, I said, Dad, that was a disaster. I've grown up from it. Um, won't happen again. And he goes, you're damn right it won't happen again because you cheated me. He goes, I gave you the opportunity I laid the path and opened the door, and you let me down, okay? And my hair still stands on end when I say that, right? So I tell my kids, and I tell the people that work with me, you got to feel great about things, and you can't cheat. You just can't do the boilerplate proposal. If you're going to talk to a company tomorrow, aim high. Don't do what you normally do. Do something different that's going to make them want to do business with you. Do the research. What can I do extra to be great? Being great really wears you out. It's very, but man, when you win, does, is winning the greatest thing? It just feels so good to win, right? And I ask people not to cheat, right? If you're not giving your best effort every day, you're cheating. What you cheat is not just the business, but your family. So let me get a little corny and emotional with you. I have two terrific kids. They're both in sales. If you call my office Tuesday morning at 6.15, Joe will give you the number. I'll answer the phone, okay? Now, part of it is I can't sleep anymore, and I go read the papers online. But my kids have always, I wanted them to see me outwork anybody. Nobody will ever outwork your dad. And it is about hard work. When they come and they complain about their job, I said, you got to keep working hard, though, right? And i got to be that type of role model. The two best managers I ever had were my mom and dad. We had enormous discipline, but a great Italian family, so we had great tradition and fun. And I am a zero-excuse person. My older brother, Joey, who we lost a few years ago, was severely handicapped. Couldn't even go to the bathroom by himself. For 50 years, I watched my mother take care of that boy. 50 years, and my sister and I had spectacular lives. We didn't even know, didn't you feel like something was wrong with Joey? That's just the way it was. And that woman never, ever complained. And when I called and I said, hey, our branch was number one, or I got this big order, it lit up her day. It made her feel good. So you know the kids who go, hey, I don't do it for your parents? I did it for my parents. And I want these kids to feel great about what they do. So we can't cheat. You guys with me? Right? And then leadership. Remember the Dirty Harry movies? Right? Because we want to be very... If you remember Dirty Harry, he has destroyed the whole 
town, and he's in, his, he's in the boss's office. You know how boss chairs are. It's a big, big office, and there's a big boss desk, and the, and the, and the boss is in his big chair. And, and he's telling Harry, you, got it. you should have done this, you should have done this, and you should have done this. And he gets done, and he looks at Clint Eastwood, and he goes, you got anything to say for yourself? And Clint Eastwood leans forward and goes, yeah, I don't take any advice from anybody whose butt is the same shape as their chair, right? So we get out and do it. I'm 61 years old. If a kid's got a copier call and it's a $1,000 printer, I'm going with the kid. I'm going to try to help. I'm going to try to teach. You guys with me? Leaders lead. Leaders inspired. Leaders don't cheat. Okay. It's unbelievable. Hey, great prop here. You guys did great. Okay. So I have all, I'm not going to PowerPoint you to death. Change. Please leave here today saying, I'm going to change some things. And you can do all the great team building, get on the rope, do all that stuff. You have to have people who want to change. And then the hammer is somebody's got to force it through. It's got to go happen or we become cynical, don't we? Oh, remember that thing we went through? Nothing ever happened with you. You've got to cross the goal line. Okay. Performance. I'm going to have a big flag made out of this. Nothing in the world matters more than performance. I would like to have been the shortstop for the New York Yankees. I am not good enough. I would like to have gone to Notre Dame. I wasn't good enough. But great performance gets you into the great school, doesn't it? Great performance gets you on that great soccer team or gets your kid to, the, to a different level. You have to perform. It's not a partitioned sport when you get out in the real world, is it? Performance is great, and we all talk about it. And then we all have our expectations, we have our kickoffs, and we're going to do this and plans and all that. Very few teams execute or hold themselves or everybody accountable for the plan, right? So great story about accountability. I go back to my kids. Frankie Pacetta is 14 years old, Upper Arlington, Ohio. Anybody know where that is? Yeah? Great place? <laughs> Upper Arlington, Ohio, it's Matt Kirby's 14th birthday party. Every four boys are spending the night. It's Sunday morning. We got to go to church. I get up. I'm a bit disheveled. I've got my coffee. I'm going to pick Frankie up at Matt Kirby's house. Frankie comes outside. He goes, Dad, Mr. Kirby wants to talk to you. Ooh, 7.30 in the morning, a little nervous. I roll down the window and I said, Bill, what's up? He goes, I want to congratulate you on your son. I said, what did he do? Eat the most pizza last night? No, he was one of two boys not to be arrested. And my wife, who's about 4'10", claims to be five feet. She'd need a strong wind. She's in complete command of our family. I can see my life flashing before me. Thank God, Frankie. So he comes in and he goes, yeah, a couple of ladies called and the boys snuck out the back door and went down to the park. And in Upper Arlington, if you're under 16, or 16, and, and you're at 12 o'clock, they arrest you, which is great. My kids, are, they'd have been out all the time, right? So Frankie gets in the car, and over the years, you always say stuff to your employees or your kids, and you wonder if they're listening, right? Because you can see the back of their eyes when you're talking. And I'm a big, repetitive person. We keep saying the same things before they go out. And I say the same things to my troops. And I say the same things in staff. We got to do this. We gotta, you got to stay on that theme. And I said, Frankie, we're driving home. I said, what happened? He goes, Cindy and this other girl called, and Tom and Adam jumped out. I, go, I said, did you want to go? He goes, yeah, I really wanted to go. I go, I probably would have also. And then I said, Frankie, why didn't you go? And he looked at me and he said, because you would have killed me. He was right. We would have killed him double dead. We would have broken his legs. We don't think it's funny to go to the local market and you're online and Mrs. McGillicuddy says, saw Frankie's name in the paper. We don't think it's funny at Thanksgiving to reminisce and talk about the day you got arrested. That's why we were pissed off when he got to college. He got arrested for smoking pot. It really disappointed us. So accountability, really, really important. So I've, I've been unbelievably, unbelievably fortunate in my life. And I, 
and I, and I got a chance to go to, uh, to, to get one of the head jobs at Xerox. I was living in Minnesota. Anybody from Minnesota? I lived in Eden Prairie. Yeah, yeah, my wife loved it. Me, not so much. I mean, I missed, I missed going to the Dayton. I mean, I liked it. It was nice. Way up there. Eden Prairie, big snow, really cold, plugged the car in the thing. They took me ice fishing one day, didn't like that. The Cleveland branch opens. Nobody wanted to go to Cleveland. It was the mistake at the lake at the time. Joe will remember all this, right? So I said, hell, I'll take the Cleveland job. Please don't want to go to Cleveland. I got to leave Minnesota. You got to get me out of here. So we take the Cleveland job, and they were dead last. We had about... 87 branches, they were about a $150 million operation, pretty, pretty big crew. Had about 60 sales reps, about 400 employees. And they were dead last and everything, and I gave the big rah-rah speeches what we're gonna do. Well, in three years, we doubled the revenue there. Kept a lot of the people, brought some new people in, and a lady that I worked with was gonna transfer to another office, <clears throat> and she's having dinner one night with her best friend, and her best friend's fiance was a beat writer for the Wall Street Journal. And she goes, there's this wacky guy they brought into Cleveland. A lot of fun, a lot of great meetings, cross-dresses like Vanna White, does a lot of stuff. Really great, cleaned out the riffraff. You should go talk to him. So this guy, Jim Hirsch, calls and says, I want to come do an article. I go, hey, I got to call, you know, Xerox, I got to call corporate headquarters. Xerox goes, this is great, free advertising in the Wall Street Journal. This would be unbelievable. Bring him in. So this guy comes in, he spends three days take him out to customers, he meets people, Six Sigma, all that kind of stuff, spends the last two hours in an interview with me, goes away, three months go by, nothing. I sell copiers, who the hell's gonna write about that? You wouldn't read it. All of a sudden, it's September 23rd, about four o'clock in the afternoon, he goes, hey Frank, Jim Hirsch, I said, what's up? He goes, hey, you're gonna be in the Wall Street Journal tomorrow. I said, no way, what page? And he got mad, I didn't know who he was, I don't read the Wall Street, I still don't read it. The only day I read it was when I was in it. He goes, he goes, you're going to be in the front page of the Wall Street Journal, da 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 He goes, I'm going to make you famous outside the company, and I'm going to make you infamous inside the company. He was right. My Xerox career basically ended that day. Here's the actual paper. It said, to one Xerox man, selling photocopiers is a gambler's game. Frank Facetta, emulating his hero, Vince Lombardi, inspires love, fear, cold calls, and surprise attacks. Didn't go over big in corporate. Kind of made fun of bureaucracy and leaders who sit at their desk and uninspi uninspiring whatever they are, that type of thing. So the phone starts ringing off the hook. Very first phone call was from my father the next morning. He was choked up. I was choked up. He had gone to all the news. You guys know what a newspaper is? You know what a newspaper is? You used to have these things, and there'd be paper, and you'd give the guy, you know, you'd actually take the paper home and you'd read it. Anyway, he gets all the newspapers, Italian family, so we all live in the same area, and he dropped them off at Aunt Val and Uncle Dom and all that. He's choked up. The 1.4 has been expunged forever. My son finally did something. So Paul McKinnon's in the office with me, big round face guys, my daughter's godfather, and the phone's ringing off the hook. People trying to sell me stuff. I wound up writing my first book. The, the agent called, da 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 Then I get this call, Frank, Frank, is that him? I go, yeah. He goes, this is Ross Perot. I go, yeah, right. It's like 7.30 in the morning. He goes, I thought you'd feel that way. Here's my phone number. Call me. You guys remember Ross Perot? That's why I don't do speeches anymore. So my stuff doesn't happen. So we hang up, Paul McKinnon's face is lit up like a Christmas tree. No more copy machines. No more, Tony, you're going to go work for Morris Perot. You're going to take me with you. We're going to make millions of dollars. 7.30 in the morning in Cleveland. So what time was it in Dallas? 6.30. So either he has insomnia or he's crazy, but he's rich crazy. Call him back, and he goes, saw the article in the Wall Street Journal. You're the type of person that we need in my company. Enthusiasm, bureaucracy, buster, ba-boom, ba-boom. I want to come see you. And I go, well, I don't have my calendar. And I said, Renee's not here. He goes, go get your calendar. I got up, ran up. You know, back in the day, we had the cat. You ever wrote everything down? You didn't put it in the thing. And I'm choking like hell. I'm so scared. Paul's trying to calm me down. Finally, he says, uh, I said, two weeks this week. He goes, what if I fly in tonight? 
fly in tonight. You can't do that. I got to get my car cleaned. A lot has to happen. So we finally set the date. If you're familiar with Cleveland, we lived in Hudson, about 45 minutes from the airport in Cleveland. All week, we'd get there getting me ready. I was going to drive Jeff Collier's Mercedes Benz. And Paul McKinnon says, no way. You drive your car. He puts his pants on the same way you do. He just has a couple extra billion dollars in his pocket. Julie cleans the house, gets a cleaning lady, and cleans it again, right? I go to the store, and I get Jack Daniels. Southern Comfort. I figure the way the guy acts, he's got to be hammered. You just don't act that way. <laughs> so I'm going to make sure we are ready for Ross Perot, right? So he shows up, plane lands. Of course, it's on the he didn't come commercial. Comes down, he's got a little aviator glasses. Just me in this private area. There's a phone booth and, and a lady at the register's office. He walks in, he goes, Frank Pacetta? And I go, Ross Perot? I was nervous, and he hugged me. Perot hugged me at Xerox. They said, you can't hug anybody. You know, HR, you can't, be, you can't do any of that stuff, or we'll put you in jail, and we'll give you 40 lashes, right? You're so damn emotional. You'll never be anything. You'll never amount to anything. <laughs> but Perot hugged me. Then he goes, I need to use the phone. And this is all how you always try to learn from somebody better than you. Whoever answered the phone, he said, did you get any business today? And I'm going, whoa. That is big time. He didn't ask him, how are you doing? Hey, did we get anything today? Then we get in the car. So I got 45 minutes in the car with Ross Perot. He does the talking, and you do the shutting up, right? And he goes, Frank, do you recruit? Got the best recruiting process in the whole world. We get 100 candidates. We stick bamboo shoots up their fingernails. They have to go through 20 different interviews. We do psychological tests. We brain scan them. And if they're worth a damn, the last one comes to me, and I get them through. And he goes, I didn't ask you that. Do you recruit? And I go, what do you mean, Ross? And he goes, who's the number one competitor in town? I said, Kodak. Who's their best rep? I don't know. Who's their best sales manager? I don't know. He goes, you don't recruit, Frank. You're sticking to your company's process. The same old boring thing that brings right comp Just the same old boring. Go get the best candidates. That, ladies and gentlemen, from that day on, how I recruit has changed, right? I will call, if I get a kid coming in, I'll call the parent and say, let me tell you what we're going to do for your child. Anybody here done that? Right? Or I want them to feel great. You have to go, and if it takes five years, eventually I want you to come work for me. Okay? And I'm going to keep asking you about it. You can't back off this. You've got to have great people. So recruiting, he changed how I thought. And I'm the head guy in Cleveland. I had a big office with a big boss chair. And he goes, if I call Paul Allaire with a customer complaint, he was the CEO of Xerox at the time, will Paul call me back? He'll call you right back. You're Ross Perot. He goes, if John Doe calls, oh, come on, Ross, we have 900 billion customers. Somebody will call, the complaint compartment will call you back. He goes, why won't Paul Allaire call me back? And I said, because it's, he's, in, he's in meetings. And Perot says that's the other problem. It gets too big and unwieldy, and you get further and further away from the customer. He said business is where the customer is. Leaders need to be close to the business. They got to be able to change. They got to find a way to leap over the competition, and they've got to aim high. So we finally get to my house. My wife's that big. He's this big. They look like they belonged on top of a wedding cake. He drank, he drank Perrier, so I spent all that money, but we still kept in touch. I didn't go work for him because he's you know, a little different. But an unbelievable learning experience coming from him took me to another level. So I'll close with this. This is an acetate. You guys remember that? Overhead. So my Xerox career is over. They're not going to make me president. I'm their problem child. My numbers are so good they can't get rid of me. The Columbus branch opens. My wife's from Columbus. I said, I want to go down there. So we go down to Columbus, and in the nine key categories at Xerox, they had finished last in all nine, and Columbus is a spectacular marketplace, thriving, no, no smokestacks, terrific. They should be doing much better. Sales hated service. Service hated sales. The entire group hated administration. It was all hatred everywhere. We had a beautiful meeting. We had an event planned. It was unbelievable. I had dance. Hey, by the way, at our kickoff this year, I did that Cupid shuffle. Okay. Got it on film. I'll send it to Joe. You can see it. 
right? So I get up and I go, here's what we're, I took this thing and I crowd just like this in a big amphitheater and I threw it on the floor and I said, never ever again will we perform like this. And I don't have a two, three or five year plan. In 90 days, we're changing this place. Are you guys with me? And then there's the thirds. There's the third going, yeah, I'm with you. The performers, the ones that are begging, they're thirsty for leadership. Then there's the cautious third. Mm, he sounds like we're going to have to work a little harder. and He's going to check on us. And then there's the third. Oh, we'll eat him, spit him out. He'll be out of here in two years, just like we did to the other guy. That year, we finished as the number one branch in all of Xerox. And the next five years were, were beyond belief just by sticking to fundamentals. I talked to the millennials. The millenniums today go, all the things you have is great, but you cannot replace the old fundamentals. Hard work, outworking the other person, not just in the number of hours, but what do I do when I get in front to show why my product, why is my city where you should come? Why should I be your event planner? This is why when you do this, you're going to make an impact on your employees, and it's going to move the needle, and you're going to get great results. Are you people with me? Yes. Okay, so everybody stand up. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to announce that each of you had the best years you've ever had. You, right, that's what we're going to do. You're just a little bit ahead of me. I know you all don't know each other, but we're going to make believe we have just won the Super Bowl. I'll make the announcement. We are going to hug each other. We're going to yell. We're going to scream just like we won the Super Bowl. Hey, the numbers are in. We did it. We're number one. Hip, hip. Hip, hip! Hip, hip! Thank you.